hello, um, hello. Right, th th this is now the actual start of the event. Um, we got there. Uh, thanks so much uh, for all coming tonight. Um, I'm Ian from the Fruit Market Gallery, and it's lovely to be um, hosting uh, Prototype tonight. Um, Prototype is a publisher that we absolutely love. Um, we love having in our bookshop. We love spending time with the works um, and with the authors uh, who Jess publishes there. So when there was the chance to bring some of the authors together into uh, a, an open-ended hybrid package, it seemed like a really great thing to do. And clearly it was, and it's found uh, this wonderful audience tonight. So I've, all I'm really doing is just saying, great to have you here in the space. Uh, most of the books that you're going to hear from tonight are available for sale in the shop, so please do consider uh, supporting the press and us um, by doing that. Um, other than that, enjoy yourselves, and I'm going to hand over to Jess to introduce from Prototype. Um, thank you so much, Ian. It's so lovely to be here and to see so many people. It's kind of unknown whether... Uh, people will come um, and it's just really lovely and warming to see all of you here. Um, this is the first time, well it still feels like a new thing to be doing events as we, well as COVID's not over but it's still um, exciting and special to come together. Um, Leela and I did manage a launch for her book when it came out but um, for Elizabeth and Amanda and Caleb this is the first time that we've been able to do something in person for their books that came out over the last few years so um, it's really lovely to finally be able to do that. Um, I'm not going to say too much as well. After the readings, um, we're all going to come together for a discussion um, when you'll hear a bit more from me. Um, but we're first going to hear from Elizabeth and Amanda um, talking about and reading from their book, Microbursts, um, which is a really stunning collection of um, essays, poetry, imagery. Um, I'll let them... They'll. I'll show you parts from it, but it's really very special and was the first book that ever was pitched to prototype um, the day after I announced that it was starting in the bookseller, so it's quite special. Um, we will then hear Caleb reading from his poetry collection, uh, the first time I've heard you read from it, I think, apart from it, our online launch. Um, and then Leela is going to read or play us something um, from her collection, and then we'll all... Um, uh, have a discussion. Um, but thank you so much, Ian, for welcoming us. Um, it's really so, so lovely to be here. Um, enjoy the evening, and I'll be back a bit later. Hi. It's really wonderful to see all of you, and as uh, Jess has said, it's um, great to do a live event, and uh, it will be our first um, kind of proper face-to-face uh, -face event for microbursts. So we have been thrilled to be published by Prototype. Jess is, I think, quite modest in her skills and her just generosity and, and how wonderful it was to be by, published by somebody who saw this book for what it was, which is a hybrid text, which is between, it really, the images and the text work so well together, and we had kind of submitted it a couple other places, and they wanted just to, to write it as poetry. They just didn't even see the design, and it was just lovely that instantly it was seen for what it was. So, um, such a pleasure, and the whole process has been wonderful. So, um, microbursts um, it is my writing. It's uh, the texts and the, the pieces are are mine, and they originally um, came out of a doctorate that I did. So I wrote my first novel as part of that. And for the critical component, I wanted to make the critical component feel like writing poetry or fiction. I wanted it to have that excitement for me, but also for people who met it. I didn't want it to be fact based or fact led, I wanted it to be very much um, an experience. And so um, that was much longer and included other themes and other subjects. And so once I got the doctorate and did that, um, and things changed, as you'll kind of see, there's a memoir aspect to this. Uh, I figured out that this was the book. Microbursts was the distillation of the work that I did for that. So Microbursts is about the illness and death of both of my parents. So, um, and what I did is I recorded a lot of, as I started thinking into the essay form for the doctorate, that was when they both got worse, my dad first and then my mom. And so I was taking notes that whole time and, and that kind of came to the surface as I was writing about things like creativity and the literature and everything else I was doing in the critical component. And uh, so that it, it has that as a 
guide, and maybe later we can kind of talk a little bit about structure and some of the de decisions made, because this is about hybrid poetries, so in some ways about the decisions that we make. But I'm just gonna start by, by reading um, a couple pieces. And then um, it became, I had written a lot of the pieces and it became a collaboration with Amanda, as she kind of said, I wonder what this would look at, like as an artist book. And so then we just started discussions about that and, and how it impacted the writing, but the whole, the whole way the book happened. So I'm gonna start reading and then we'll talk a little bit about that and Amanda will show a little bit of the image and the design and then I'll do a couple readings at the end and you'll let us know if we're in time. Between places. There are words for the kinds of spaces that exist between other places and many of them are about landscape like literal, ecotone, twilight. In between places, there is something solid, a traveler crossing over. The very details noticed in the midst of travel or shock or bewilderment can hold us fast. Lost becomes found, the strange settles into a familiar. In the black coolant of sky northwest of where I live, a compass will not work because the magnetic hills disrupt the heart of this simple object that gives direction. In February 2010, I take notes even when I'm too tired. With my computer on my lap, I video a note of each day. My hair is up or down, glasses on or perched, and my eyes are sleep-filled. The last recording just past midnight and into the 19th is grainy, like an old film, filmed in the dark of his room. The small light on the top of the bureau is not up to the job of illuminating. I whisper, and sometimes in the background, Dad can be heard. This is all I will write of this night, how we listen. On the 16th of October, 2013, the conversation with my mom lasts only three minutes. By evening, she's unable to speak, and the meds they give her over the next few days are quickly noted and point only towards one thing. Here, in these places between lost and found, I witness in silence and in deafening chaos, and I make up stories that will be memories. Walking upon terra incognita, love becomes grief, essay, poem. Each memory forges a new path, and this writing acts like a magnet pressed to the face of my compass. What we did not know. On some hills where rocks balance on inclines, there is a point geologists call the angle of no strain. Rocks repose despite steepness because all conditions allow for rest. I sleep lying down, pace upright, and when I lean, I need a wall or a chair or a person to lean against. During this first summer, we dismantle a home and forget how to talk to each other. We nearly break up more than once, and then it's autumn, and we move from Scotland to Chicago, carrying four items of luggage, which we hope will last the two years we'll spend there. Our new apartment is filthy, noisy, and perfectly located for you to travel south and for me to travel north. Your train loops the loop, mine goes to the end of the line and returns. We're a closed system and there's pressure from inside and out to break apart our vicious little circle. Ghosts. On the edge of the lake sits a house, half built in depression, half in wealth. With the help of friends, her dad raised it from the ground with his bare hands and hard times. But that was years ago, and now it's a neighborhood eyesore on such a sought-after piece of land beside the water. Storm surges beat at her door as her husband locks cupboards and opens drawers inappropriately. Just before it's raised, I stand on the pothole driveway and can see right through the place, past closed drawers and open cupboards and out to the water. Two blocks away at 7.31, my mom is dizzy and my dad says he's doing just fine, but he often says, honey, can you just go get that for me? This afternoon, they've got what they need. I'm on my way home to our apartment and from the L tracks, I see lakescapes and skyscrapers and flags flying at Wrigley Field. And when I was 15, my dad nearly died. The lake rose and retreated. He came back, the lake, the lake, the lake and all seasons. So you might notice that I am kind of a dual national, so I've been in Scotland about 25 years. Um, but for two years, uh, I, we went to Chicago and kind of, I thought, oh, I'll spend some time with my parents. And then they got kind of really ill during that time. So that became like a kind of a center point to a lot of the things um, in the book. And so I'm gonna read. So 
I had gotten my doctorate about 2009, 2010, and then my dad got ill and he died in February 2010. And then with my mom was kind of a surprise. We didn't kind of really know. We knew she had Parkinson's, but we didn't really know she had a kind of a more severe uh, called multiple system atrophy. Um, and so when she died in 2013, Amanda and I are partners and, and Amanda was with me um, when we were there and we had gone to the city after the funeral and after the memorial and Amanda said, oh, I wanna do something with this. And so then we sat there walking through these streets. It was really, it was cold and, and walking through the streets and talking about what we might do. So I'm gonna read um, a, a piece and we're gonna start then talking a little bit about some of the decisions that we made um, there. The healthy one. Dad is still slurring his words so out of it that he doesn't take any of his meds on his first night home from the hospital, his skin hanging off him and yet he's still puffy, his memory affected, his breath halted, cut off, his short gait uneven and I can see the straight pain shoot through the roundness of his hip joints. His legs, which he insists aren't retaining water, are nonetheless hardly bending at all on his way up the stairs. His left leg goes first, his right follows, six half-halted breaths per step, not like he's been asked to do it, in through the nose and out through pursed lips to give him more oxygen, and I'm worried about him by the third step, worried because he's too heavy for me to stop if he staggers backwards, or if he stalls, seven more steps to go, and then five, and then a dozen flat shuffled steps to the folded chair unfolded in front of his bed. His stride is shorter than it used to be, in two months' time, after my mum's had surgery, when she can't move her head on the bed, or when her hands shake so much she can't put, her, put on her glasses or hold a cup of water steady enough to drink. He'll say he's the healthy one. So what was really interesting about when Elizabeth had written these essays, which were really emotionally strong and charged and hard, there were so many questions about the space around them. How do you create the space and work for the unspoken? How do you create space for, in a sense, three narratives, the story of her mum, the story of her dad, and Elizabeth's story herself? And I suppose, as an artist, I make a lot of artists' books, and I'm always really interested in that kind of relationship between form and subject and space, I always think space is a really important part of everything that you do. And when we began to talk about how we might rework this fantastic, your words, thinking about positionality in the space became really important. So in terms of these last two pieces that we've read, this kind of became the format of the book. So on the top left. left, thank you, tends to be Elizabeth's dad's words, bottom right, Elizabeth's mum's story, and things that are centered in the middle become either Elizabeth's or a more kind of general, generic Like this is a Solnit voice. quote, a Rebecca Solnit quote. Um, and then once we started with that kind of template, it became really interesting just to play with that template and also to play with the space that we could create and almost the shifting elements of connectivity and separation. Because I think in grief and illness and death, there's these moments of real kind of intense connection, but moments of feeling completely separate and also feelings of wordlessness. So how do you create that in book form, I suppose? So, We'll just keep. Yeah. And there was a sense we almost, we thought about doing like wax paper so that the narratives were over each other. Um, but we liked this, the kind of the way that they pressed against each other. But also should say that once we started doing this, then I edited the pieces. So that process of being able to put them on the page really allowed them to become more concise. And that was clearly two separate po pieces that kind of came together. Mm -hmm. So it really altered in a fundamental way the way that you could move through the piece. And then there's also the question of where we were. We were in Chicago, and as we were in this really kind of intense time, they had moments of joy and moments of fun, etc. as well, but the city was still going on. The lake, which you can't really see, Lake Michigan was always there in the background. You know, there was this kind of 
horizon line that was always there that you could go to, and that was actually a place that we both would go to just for some peace and quiet. So there was the kind of the lake was there, and then also I think these questions of that just looks like a blank. It phrase, does just look. That's <laughs> the lake and mist. <laughs> 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 um, but yeah. There's also these kind of, I suppose, kind of signifiers of what Elizabeth's mum and dad were like. And, you know, there was these moments when you were kind of cleaning the house when you, you came upon these objects that really spoke to what Frank was like. So they became part of the book as well. So rather than the kind of the descriptors of your dad or your mum, throughout there's just these kind of elements of um, your dad just being a complete everything was in order, everything was listed, everything was just right, and in a way his death was extremely hard, but it was that same kind of thing. He used um, to have cards for well. all of my friends, and so Amanda would have a card on there, which I think is also <laughs> kind of a lovely thing. <laughs> Names um, of their parents. Yeah. And then, of course, Chicago, as well, was always his backdrop. And as I said, there was moments of wordlessness, but there was also these moments of just absolute intensity as well. Sorry, the people over there can't really see anything. Can you see enough? Just buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so. I feel like we should talk about microburst, but yeah, again. Oh yeah, do you want to? No, that's fine. We can talk um, about it later. My heart is not still. Tonight, standing at the front of the room to teach, I imagine your body along the front of my own, thighs right here, your hand beneath my shirt, still and cool with a small top of water where an icicle has melted. Standing here, I don't say anything about my mother or her stay in rehab or about being up at 5 a.m. again or how I cried all through yesterday. I am silent about the bitter walks to the frozen lake. I say nothing about how that lunch today, sitting across from my dad in a ubiquitous sandwich place, we said nothing about how bad mom looked yesterday. Nothing about how we didn't talk as we stared out the window at the dirt gray sky or as we drove in silence to visit her. Are we, I think we're about time. I think I'll just read the, the um. Do you want to read the? Uh, well, then let's do oh. wax wings and then. Okay, sorry. Right. Wax wings. We plant pale rowan trees on both sides of the doorway for protection, and in winter they stand with bare spindles for branches, a few hastily crushed berries on the ground. Other trees, bigger and nestled between spruces, are laden, and in the air, bells. Fourteenth of February morning. If he can walk, if he can support his weight, if he can make it unaided to the toilet, if he can remember what it was like to be here in his house, curious, if only his favorite cereal would taste like it used to, if he could do his taxes, the world is round and the sun wakes him, often colorful before it is bright. There isn't a this or a that, assisted living or skilled nursing, it's a continuum, they say. He slides to the floor, he says. He slides on the slippery floor 12 times, maybe more. My mom is thin and her rotator cuff causes her problems. She shakes, nearly has blackouts, although she's not fallen yet. He has to sit or lie on the floor until someone else can assist him. This is what we don't want. Weak sun, winter over the lake, which changes daily to ice and to water and back to a state of slush. It undulates especially in the light at dawn. This is morning. The early start so we can make the rounds. I do not set an alarm. I am woken by worries and by this light. I keep the windows wide and wish the air through the vents was wind. Even with the window open, the world outside and inside is still. If then this, if all the doctors say his numbers are good, then why is he dying? Us. Thank, Thank you. you. Am I on? Yes. Thank you. Sunrise. 
I turned the corner and spied a nice car. I opened the door, pulled out the driver, and got in. I played music on the radio. I drove along the road. It was dark, and the lights were broken. I screamed around the corner and knocked another car into a lamppost. I swapped vehicle for a parked van. In the van, the radio made me feel odd. I drove through a park. It was as though it was played on the wrong instruments. It was empty and confusing. It might just have been another park. The driver from before was running around the dark lake. I turned off the radio. I drove around the dark lake. I was driving around the lake, but then I headed for the power station. The horizon in the window was further than I thought. I drove for a while. I felt odd with no music. I parked the van. I found a pair of headphones on someone else so that I could listen to music while I looked around the power station. I walked along the pavement to the far corner. I walked around the corner. Each of the corners led to another one. I turned in the other direction. It was the same, but the original direction was better. I span in that direction and took the corners when they arrived. The sun was coming up. There was a nice car, but I didn't get it. I thought that around the corner I would see something else. There was sunlight coming through. The headphones were gone. I threw aside a manhole cover and climbed down. In the tunnel, water dripped on water. There was so much light. I walked through the tunnel. I walked through the tunnel. I walked, and then it was too bright, and then I went on. That's the first poem、um, in this book, "Away from Me," which came out last year,、um, and it, it is a book that was written over five or six years,、um, and I didn't really know.、Um, What it was about、um, until、um, I, I wrote this next poem, which is called "Today."、Um, today, I storm the Parliament building. I force the illegitimate protesters from the Parliament building. A faint bruise on my little finger turns out to have been black rubber from the handle of my badminton racket. The pain washes right off, and I find myself nodding kindly to strangers. My heart stops on the lumpy B road following the Saint Teeth Carnival. As the tide comes in on the Norfolk coast, I wade out to the toddler hooked on the black rocks. I am wrapped in my bed sheets and taken to a hospital where agents of the state serve me poison. I am not going to play football in China. I laugh at my friend's little finger, cocked as though drinking tea with the Queen, until the grenade explodes. Until I expired in California, I was Minnie Mouse. For mistaking myself a victim of a Westminster VIP paedophile ring, I enter my cell. On my smallest knuckle, there is a milky scar, recently grown legs and wings. I am tearful as my stunt double breaks my back. My daughter falls from a cruise ship window. The hairs on my little finger are unstoppable. I will not face a rape charge in Las Vegas. In my experience, it's the only part of the body completely useless for sex. I am lined up on the galley floor by the Iranian crew. I line up the British crew on the galley floor of my ship. I feel anxious suddenly that my little finger is glossier than the little fingers. Of the friends who demand most respect, is there a correlation between those with smart little fingers and those who are rewarded with status and wealth? Since when do I dislike little fingers based on their relative glossiness? Since now, since I mislaid my life on the way home from the funeral, since I spilled into the sea in a remote and pristine region of Patagonia, since. I dispersed 40,000 liters of diesel across my churning surface. Since I swelled through the palace gardens holding the rainbow flag, since I sprayed bullets at a garlic festival, since the smell lingered on my little. An exciting glass of water.
Um, this poem is called Middlemarch, and um, uh, it's a kind of documentary poem in that everything that happens in it is, uh, is, is drawn from real life. Um, but they are moments that uh, I wanted to be kind of weightless, moments that would never be included in any other kind of literature. Amir kneels to watch a shoal pass through another shoal. Jamila asks her companions the name of the waiter. Freya plays brothers in arms with her band around the wall. Fish nibble rice in Harry's dishwater. Carl stops his tram for a samba band. Neil glances at the wing mirror and then at his phone. Caleb hurries through the uneven scrubland. Oreb convinces the family not to return home. Basak mops up sauce from her mother's plate. At the orphanage, Xavier greets the new children. Dusan looks in the box to find a good net. Once settled on the train, Chu eats a steamed bun. Rail's friend is upset, and Rail holds his friend's hand. Sung Wan sings and rolls over in her sleep. Gabriel spends some time checking on the odd sound. Ming Ma looks for caterpillar fungus on the slope. Thea chews along with the music. Valerie sucks a mint with her eyes on the stars. Pierre hops towards his other sock. Udu rubs his big toe while he says his prayers. Ivan opens the plug of his sewing machine. Yesenia tucks a stranger into her own bed. Erai starts the car and leaves it running. Vasily laughs because his leg has gone dead. Lara enters the stage and unbuttons her gown. Jana giggles while she pretends to frown. Um, this is a. This poem is a, is a sequel to to Kafka's story, The Hunger Artist, um, which is a story about somebody who hungers for a living which was like a real thing, apparently. Um, and who uh, eventually, in the story, dies from hungering <laughs> um, and is replaced in his cage, much to everyone's delight, by a panther. It's called Sequel. There comes a time, the time is now, when the characters in the old books walk out of there. For example, the panther. I saw eating a chicken shamelessly in a cage. Replace the dead hunger artist is now in Florida, in America. Not on holiday, sadly. Let's call the panther Francis, indigenous to DDT. Field, fish, raccoon, Francis can't breed. In a food coma injected by a scientist with ketamine, placed an electrode in its anus, forcing Francis to come. Symbol of freedom, we held hands during takeoff, watched the locust disintegrate, sang the victory song. Can we have our symbol back? Tongue flopped on the sanitized table like a meat. Sweet breath of the dealer with the two pairs of trousers. Francis mooches around the swamp, sticky on my shield. Mouse pad, domestic alarm system, inside the bliss. Um, where is it? I'll read two more poems. Um, and this one is called The Sun Looks In and the Whole World With It. I remember the first portrait with an open window. And through the window, a landscape. And in the landscape, other people. And each of these people should have their own portrait by an open window, but as far as I know, they do not. The landscape perched on the sitter's shoulder like a tame parrot feathered with peasants, a bird trained to sense the kind of silence that invites, like an open window, a presence to fill the empty frame, which in this case is a squawked 
hello, a greeting that to our relief will not blossom into pleasantries, saving us the awkwardness of leaning through the open window to ask, and what do you do? Because all the parrot made of peasants does is it says, hello. What you do is look. I remember the portrait was what my eyes felt like to leave his house. The window closed behind me. The old man had seasoned his bedroom with salt to kill the mites that I could not see, but which looked to him like salt. After sunset they came, he said, straight through the open window. Um, and this is the, the last poem in the collection. Um, and I just want to thank um, Jess and Ian for having, having me here. It's a real pleasure. Um, and this is called Sunset, and it's a kind of companion to the first poem in the collection. I turned the corner and spied a nice shell. I clamped onto the arm, pulled out the body, and crawled in. I heard the sea inside. I crawled along the beach. It was light, and the shell was cracked. I went under a rock. I went under a rock. I went under a rock. I swapped vehicle for an empty shell. In the shell, the salt made me feel odd. The dark seaweed crackled. The air was empty and confusing. It was as though it was the wrong instrument. It might have been another storm. The guy from before was crawling around a pool. I crawled away from the dark seaweed. I crawled around the pool. I was crawling around the pool, but then I headed for the warm water bubbling out of the pipe. The horizon in the warm water was further than I thought. I crawled for a while. I felt odd with no crackling. I set down the shell. The shell's shape is truly excellent. I found a pair of ants on someone else so that I could listen to them while I looked around the warm water. I crawled along the sand to the edge of the bubbling water. I crawled around the bubbling water. I turned in the other direction. It was the same. But the original direction was better. I span in that direction. The sun was going down. There was a nice shell, but I didn't get it. I thought that in the warm water, I could see something else. There was a darkness coming through. I drew warm sand over my back. The ants were gone. I threw aside a pebble and climbed down. The music in the tunnel was like water, dripping on water. There was so much darkness. I crawled through the tunnel. I crawled through the tunnel. I crawled through, and then it was too dark, and then I went on. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me OK? Yeah. Um, it's lovely to see all of you here. Um, and it's really nice to see some of your, my friends who came over from various places. Um, I used to live in Edinburgh, and I haven't been back for four years, so it's, it's quite nice. Um, yeah, b I'm going to read two poems today, um, but I just wanted to thank um, Ian and Jess for supporting me and for your friendship. Um, the first poem I'm going to read is called Ricochet. Um, and the second one is called Fiefdom of X. Um, and both the soundscapes that I'll be playing with my poetry was made um, in a collaboration between me and Matthew Hamblin, who I'm in a band with called Cloth. the lights broke and everyone was happy. We 
we hurtled through the night and shadows raced across our tables and faces. It felt good, like we were getting away with something. That's not part of the piece. <laughs> Let's just start over. <laughs> During the journey, the lights broke and everyone was happy. We hurtled through the night and shadows raced across our tables and faces. It felt good, like we were getting away with something. A ball rivers into view, carrying a meridian whiff of passings and doublings. Gifts for children, a cylinder, a cuboid, a sphere. Its smoothness reflects my panic on its brassy surface. An impossible smoothness, tight and fleshy, but metal, it has no give. I hide it behind the door and later between the cushions of the sofa. Always in the frame of my own scrutiny my hand reaching to cover its insistent mirror. My language is a room I sit in daily. The sweet pea fragrances the room. I'm addicted to its candy smell, the unfurled earlobe pink. It has an odor that can't be captured or remembered and must be refreshed each time. 
a tight bud of possibility, clenched tight, not yet awake. A line is drawn somewhere between the perimeter of the lake under the sign of the hotel and the writhing blind voles emerging from my soil under my raking hand. The line wobbles, but it always holds sway. Up on the hill, I saw a red car traversing the landscape. It reminded me of the other times I saw a car like that a little red bug crossing a two-dimensional, hazy scene. To feel profoundly still, flat, and monochromatic, while the insectin vehicle investigates a contour, declaring an alien movement and intuition. A spell of sun, and I am thrown into wild relief. Blue solar arrow plus hatchlings. Light hazels. Light hazels in a crazing to the grays. I stretch my ear. Voices are arriving, colored cherries. Yellow, black, orange, and purple hanging loosely like whims. A cold, delicious party an open river syllabub given late in the evening. Tears are so leisurely canting the face. Thanks to this surrealism, the image becomes unfalsified. I came to know grief as a kind of taste, a new conversance with otherness, like a tree trying its shadow for depth. I try to pray. You are a tree moving its leaves, thinking of the breeze. A mushroom emerges in the one light, moving aside a piece of mulch. The unbelievable world built on the backbone of an enormous trout. Bird on a post triggers to flight. In the morning, draw from the fund of an old dream. A voice shoots out, cutting through the haze of sleep. It's a feeling out, afraid and wanting to know its dimensions. Is it filling a box or is the space endlessly expansive? A wide, flat valley. Cows walk in a straight line along the field. Green, yellow green, dark green, an orange windsock stiff in the breeze, an airport. A ball sails onto the gridded blue floor, hits the adjacent side wall, makes a tight or narrow angle to hit the floor again. Memory moves always to an unexpected space in consequence of the intention, but missing wide the original direction. Um, I was going to play another piece, but do you think the audio might be only possible from a laptop? Um, if it is, that's fine. I might read something else. If I was okay. Um, yeah, I was going to read a piece um, which was called Fiefdom of X, but I think it <coughs> won't sound as good coming from a laptop, so I'm going to change my mind and read a sequence from this book instead. So thanks, <laughs> thanks for your patience.
pictorial program. The dog wanted to go one way. The dog wanted to go one way and I another. The leaves pressed their five red leaves, fingers lightly on the ground. All around us was casual destruction and I don't blame it on the weather. Anyhow, we had gotten used to it and made jokes that felt like having your butt pinched by a friend's partner. I admired the mean of the dog, how in the distance her silhouette looked like a fallen tree's noble and tragic. All of the pans in the kitchen. All of the pans in the kitchen were being used to boil cauliflowers, submerging the house in a deep, mephitic funk. He showed me around, entirely relaxed in attitude, lord of the duplex. A sort of constant humming emanated from his body, even as he spoke, producing curious and not entirely unpleasant overtones. I had the strong impression that he was an experimental ventriloquist. On top of the dining table was a weightlifting bench because, he said, one should always exercise with altitude. In the end, I turned down the lodgings. I couldn't imagine the musical group he insisted we form as housemates. A toppled valise emanated waves. A toppled valise emanated waves of inexplicable energy in the mathematical park. From its appearance, I gathered it had been hastily abandoned and frozen overnight, and now its contents were splayed up before it like a nervous poker hand. A large and colorful towel intended for a faraway beach, an imitation tequila hat, a paperback whose pages had rippled together, the title of which I was desperate to discover. As I poked at the book with a long branch, my dog's hackles began to rise, giving her body the appearance of an extended cockerel's comb. As if on cue, a child shrieked with uncurbed joy in the playground, plunging recklessly down the square root slide. They were amazed at what they saw. They were amazed at what they saw, a huge self-portrait of the artist, dressed like a general, sitting proud on a mound of voluptuous cushions. Next to it was a work that really made them gasp, a work that they had never seen before, having been locked away in the temperature-controlled vault of the eremitic, now-deceased patron of the arts. The painting was done in a characteristic style, in pasto to the point of pastry, the usual mountains and rushing streams. But when they looked more carefully, a hidden landscape emerged in the dizzying folds of ultramarine. There were two brocaded bays retreating, a tender mummy, a mendicant carrying a fresh sense of loss whipped up in tempera, and a doorknob wearing a ruff, signaling the rudderless drift of life. The world is all here, they thought. All day the peacock screamed. All day the peacock screamed outside the building where the conference was taking place. In one panel, three men spoke with authority about a venerable literary figure. In another panel, attendants watched the clip of gorillas performing a waterfall ritual. Lunch was taken on the lawns in the presence of the peacocks dragging their tail feathers, mewling from the parapets, shitting. In the afternoon plenary, attendants were instructed to form groups of three and to take turns walking slowly around the room with eyes closed while other members of the group performed three actions on their bodies, swipe, pat, and jiggle. Later, the conference organizer's car was found being scratched up by a peacock which has seen its own reflection in the bonnet. We all know the sound of wine being poured is sleazy. We all know the sound of wine being poured is sleazy, each propulsion of liquid galloping eagerly, even cheesily, into the glass. Don't get me wrong, I'm not parched to the promise of effervescence. These were the things most commonly brought to the party. Keys so large you rest them on your shoulder. Fragrant boxes, small black books which no one ever seemed to open. Riveting, too, were the guest's liniments, such gorgeous crimson pile and velvet silks arranged in ogied arches. Here a cambric surcoat, there a resplendent skirt trailing to the ground, garnished with infinitesimal crystal berries. And there were at least four people with wings strapped to their backs. They parroted each other barefoot, their toes in extreme angles, mysterious in their attitudes. No doubt they had conferred as to the arrangement of their compositions. 
in order to make words pleasurable. In order to make words pleasurable, the fetid author said, approach them as spearheads of delicate flint, nap them with antler battens and soft stone hammers. But I saw her art for what it really was, not a punctilious crafting of rare materials, but a reckless haunting of obscure works made flesh in modish lingo. It was a tricksy turn of pen, a vaporous bauble, a vaporous bauble. <laughs> but who am I to criticize? I too have a searing desire for recognition and have committed textual crimes in the name of amour propre. I have plumbed my own life for material, dressed up its feeble outlines, and have stuffed descriptions of sensual delicacies in every chapter. Well, I bought her book at the launch, and she signed her name in it, and not on the title page, but on the front cover, which showed two llamas sparring on a house of cards. Thank you, thanks for listening. We're just going to rearrange some chairs and come and sit at the front. If you want to go to the toilet or anything, now's the time. And we'll be all... Oh, buy books, yes. Um, we'll be ready in a, f in a few minutes. I think that all of your work is linked by um, a kind of freedom from formal constraints um, and an openness to working in the between spaces. We did an event online at some point last year with about that idea. Um, that's not really a question, but I wondered if we could just start by thinking about that and what it means to be working in between um, in between forms and genres and, and styles. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to get started. I can ask a more specific question as if that's too vague. Um, maybe we could put sure. talk in relation to Microburst to start okay. with. Yeah. Um, it's actually why I wrote Microbursts. I became so fascinated by how you work in a way that you integrate all of those things and are freed from the expectation, but then you create your own. So it's not like you're just, you know, everybody thinks that writers can do anything, but we can't do anything. As soon as you put a word down on the page and as soon as you start to think about what that is about and how you want it to be received or how you want to explore that subject, it becomes something that you're responsible to. And so I think that's how I think about hybridity. You make the decision about what you're thinking that you want, and you don't know that at the time necessarily. Sometimes it's an editorial process that's true, but you think about what you want it to do and how you want it to do it, and you make those decisions, and you test it. It's not like you just throw everything on the page and you can do anything. You're thinking ab about yeah, the ramifications that that has for how people meet the work. And I think as well it's about seeing how shifting the basic form shifts and changes meaning. You know, what happens when something becomes something else, and I suppose, so I think of, like if I'm an artist and I'm a printmaker, but I can do something as a screen print, it doesn't quite work, but I can do the same thing as an etching, and it works really well. And I think just trying the kind of variations in form to figure out what suits is actually really exciting because you're not constrained by this is what this is going to be. You're surprised sometimes by what it becomes. And that in-between space, I think, is a really exciting place for it to sit because you, you don't know quite what it's going to be, but also people don't quite know, or you don't quite know how people are going to receive it and people might receive it differently, especially when something doesn't necessarily have a beginning, a middle, and the end. Mm. Yeah, what, I think yeah. Um, what you just said, Amanda, about variation is something I'm interested in because I'm interested in taking the same text and housing it in different forms. Um, so as I mentioned, I, I play music, I make music with Matthew and also Greg, who's sitting there, and our band Food People, and we often incorporate texts, whether that's sound text or text I've written or Greg's written. Um, but I've also... Um, seen how the text appears as pamphlets, for example. So I, for this book that just came out, recently came out, um, I conceptualized it, I guess, as sequences, almost as kind of musical sequences, maybe. So that was really exciting for Prototype to be able to publish them in these discrete sections that have their own um, kind of identity, as it were. Um, so for me, I guess hybridity is about yeah, experimenting with how the same text might um, 
become embodied, I guess, through different forms, whether that be music or um, through publication or as performances. Um, so it's there's always a risk involved um, with seeing how the, <laughs> whether that's tech or wh whether how, how you feel that day, um, and, and no iteration is the same. So I think, yeah, I'm interested in hybrid. I, I feel like I don't quite have the grasp of what, I, what it is, but I think it's the sense you said about something not having a final form and that it's always transforming. Mm. Caleb, it just makes me think of, um, so before Caleb's poetry collection, um, we also published um, Caleb's novel, Fatherhood, which um, I first read quite a few years before um, as a poetry collection, or the kind of seed of that book was, was a collection of poems. Um, and over the course of a few years, it evolved into this novel. It, it definitely was a novel, but I think we ended up, we described it as a poem novel. And there was this sort of freedom in the way it moved between voices and forms, and even on the page, you can see that um, that hybridity. Um, I don't know if you what that process was like, Caleb, and the kind of transformation that that text made. Yeah. Um, so that 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 was originally uh, a collection of poems, and I could see that it was straining towards uh, some kind of narrative it, it the, the the poems wanted to have more to do with one another than they than they had uh, on the page um and so um i started kind of taking the edges off the poems and and moving them to together um and then that yeah led to a process in which there was the the, the narrative then was the determining factor i think what, what where it ended up was that there was i hope a sort of productive tension between the narrative drive, the way that you kind of wanted to move through it and that it was pulling you through, and then something else. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a book about early fatherhood, and I suppose a l I wanted to uh, capture some of the way <laughs> a lot of that is digressive and, and wayward and boring, <laughs> um, and kind of the way that it, it time sort of pulls up so there was a tension, I think, between the uh, an overarching narrative drive and then what might be called a kind of lyric. Um, how how important do you think the the idea or process of collaboration is in all of this kind of work, whether that's input from an editor or a designer or a, a collaborator? I think that, I mean, for you, Lila, there's your band, the music and working with other people and what that might bring to it. And of course, Microverse is such a collaborative piece. Um, yeah, I wonder if we could just talk a bit about that idea of collaboration. I feel like as a publisher, as a small publisher, one of the things we're able to do is to kind of really get involved in the way that a book is put together and that that can have a, a very big influence on shaping the final, the final form of a book. Um, and that's a real pleasure to be able to get involved in that way. Um, yeah, how d like how did you sort of y you referred to it a little bit earlier, but how did that how did it become a collaboration, and how did it how how did that process work and shape the hybridity of of the book? Hmm. I think it, I think what's interesting about this one was it didn't start out as a collaboration. Yeah. That it was very much a kind of what if. Yeah. You know, so Elizabeth had the essays written, they shift and changed, I think, in part because of, I suppose, the discussions about how the format was going to be. So they were kind of edited. I, I think it's probably interesting for you to go back and re-edit them, given the format that we kind of talked about. Um, but I think um, there's, there's something really interesting about collaboration in that you each bring different things to the table. You know, so Elizabeth clearly, uh, for Microburst, was, was bringing kind of all her knowledge of writing and essaying and short form essays and all of that kind of thing. You know, that was kind of there already and actually coming in and kind of, like I found it really instructive and helpful for me and my processes and my thinking beyond Microburst just for how words on a page could work kind of in, in different ways. So there was something really interesting about 
I think having that openness to try different things out to see where we were and Amanda has an amazing, you're really a good reader as well, and I think that the bringing that visual aspect to it just meant that you would say something and it would just shift the movement within the mm -hmm. work, and that was really instructive for then what, how it was edited, how it laid on the page, and the discussions as I kind of hinted at, the form that it finally was in wasn't necessarily where we started with it. Mm. And then you have things about how we wanted the images to not be illustrative, so not to you know how talk about the house and have the house there, but that it builds through the book. And they veer a little bit more towards illustrative than in the kind of the hybrid work that I really really the, that I love. But it works for this book because it because of the subject you needed some forms that also guide you through so it's got a temporal nature one year another year and then and it kind of moves on and also got has the the structure of elegy and then within that you kind of wanted to break it apart and challenge it and i think the image the, the way it was designed really helped that um, but i think amanda being a really good reader and smart with that i think really meant that those discussions were really dynamic i don't remember any of them i mean i think that's also a good sign of collaboration like i really don't remember that much of what we did yeah yeah, yeah. But i'm also interested because it's really interesting to look at both your books and our book and just the output from prototype and just mm -hmm. how it, you feel about collaboration oh as a I publisher yeah <laughs> <laughs> Do you mean in terms of my my input or just my input as a collaborator or just in the in sort of Input as a collaborator and input yeah. as, I suppose, a publisher and publishing hybrid forms yeah. in the publishing world? Because I, I think there's something yeah. really remarkable about, about what, what Prototype does. I think that there's a, um, because of the way publishing, the sort of publishing world works, it's quite hard to sometimes... Um, uh, kind of, how do you bring a book out that's hybrid? How does it? How do you categorize it? There are these sort of practical constraints. So I think um, there's a need for for publishers that are able to sort of um, not care too much about those things, um, and that there's so many. You know, in response, it's just clear how many people are working in that intersection, um, and that it can produce you know, fascinating work that if you don't worry too much about these kind of labels and how it's going to go out into the world, it will find its readers. Um, yeah, and I think, yeah, I think there's just a need for it, which is, which I see every day in the kind of work that people bring to me, whether it w because it might not so easily find another home. Um, and I think people in enjoy that process of collaboration because as you say, it brings a whole other aspect to the work, mm -hmm. another dimension. Um, Lena, what about with the way you work? Like Five Film of X, we didn't hear tonight, but I've heard it before, and it's a sort of it's a whole kind of composition. The word and music work together. What what's the process? Do you write your poetry with a kind of soundscape in mind, or how how do you work with your collaborators? And what's the process? And what comes first, or how much is the music part of your writing process? Hmm. I think it depends on the piece. Yeah. Um, Five Film of X, which is in the book, and which cloth my band recorded, mm. um, was I wrote the pieces first, the text first, yeah. and then I um, responded to it myself, and then Matthew made the kind of soundscape. Okay. Um, so that's for that particular mm. piece. But with, with other things, for Food People, for example, we sometimes sample my text and also Greg's text. Mm. Um, sometimes I write things with music in mind in a kind of sonic ekphrasis, I yeah. guess. Um, but just to add to the kind of the, the form of the book, I was really actually surprised and delighted to work with Prototype because I had so much um, input in mm. how it appeared. Because obviously, like the way the book yeah. looks and everything is, is massive. Font, for example, mm. is, a, is yeah, a big yeah. thing. I have worked with other people in the past where there wasn't, um, I mean, th they had a house font, basically. Yeah. Um, I've also worked with um, micro presses like Sam, Sam's um, If a Leaf Pulse Press, which is really great um, because there was a back and forth and yeah. Sam suggested ways of laying out the poem that I hadn't thought of yeah. at all. Um, another collaborative thing that I just want to mention with my book is um, there's a poem, a sequence of poems um, called I Bread, which was, il was illustrated by my friend Esme Armour. So that was a collaboration as well where we discussed how, what kind of image mm. um, would be put adjacent to the, 
text, but as you, you guys were saying, we didn't want it to illustrate it <laughs> um, in that way, in, in saying this is what the poem is about. But how do you evoke the feeling of it, um, the yeah. space of the text and the space of the feeling or whatever. So that was really interesting. And obviously Prototype yeah. was happy to um, publish that as well. So yeah. yeah, there's a lot of, it's shot through with collaborations. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I have got other things I can ask, but do, would anyone else like to ask anything? Yeah. Uh, two, two questions. Interesting you and how all the processes work and the nature of the aggregation of them. I just want to know how, for you guys, obviously, a lot of us, I'm sure a lot of people really were inspired, but for me today, I, I've got to go through the actual reading of the poetry, and I, I guess I want you translates through the performance and how that's connected to the words on the page and yeah. just the process. Should I repeat that, Ian? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So <laughs> this quest question about um, how the hybrid nature of, of a work kind of transfers and comes across in performance, sort of in addition to uh, or uh, as opposed to on the page. Does that sound like a fair summary? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, I mean, that, that's a really good question for me. Uh, in the <laughs> um, a, a lot, a, quite a substantial amount of the the book that I've just read from, I find impossible to read. <laughs> um, partly because it was it was written deliberately to, uh, to try and circumvent my own voice. Right? I didn't. I was trying to get away from <laughs> myself um, in 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 various ways. Um, and so it would feel like, I mean, A, it's just that actually very difficult. Like, I, I, I'm not, like, skillful enough to use my voice to read some of the things um, just because of the way that they're written. But, but B, it would feel like almost, it would, it would feel like it would subvert what the poem is trying to do on the page. So there are a few, a, a small handful of poems that I sort of feel like I can read from which kind of makes sense in my voice that I'm not kind of getting in the way of. Um, and I hope sort of have something um, of me inside them. Um, but it's particularly, I mean, I, I find it a, c a complicated thing anyway, um, how you voice your poems, but particularly with this book, I find it difficult. Yeah, yeah I, I, was, I really enjoyed listening to the, to the work today. I was telling you, Caleb, I really liked your cadence, mm. <laughs> the, way you read, the way you read it. And I, and I know the, the way the person who wrote the work performs it isn't its final or whatever form. But um, I feel like I lack the imagination <laughs> to read other people's work, not in my own voice. Um, so it's really refreshing to <laughs> hear people reading their work. Um, and I think, yeah, I, I think that that's a really good question because the way that it's performed is obviously another hybrid act, as it were. Um, yeah. A good question, and I haven't really. I, 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 I think I think of the book as being a book. Mm -hmm. I, I think of it as, and maybe a more because of the subject matter, more of a private exchange with the reader, and one that I hope can evoke a response and a sense of um, com community or something like a, something familiar there. So uh, this is only my first, my really my first live event for microburst and it was it, it, it's it, because it's personal it's also I need to remove myself from that as well in a way so uh, to make it about the work and I think one of the things about the hybridity and that and that the formatting and the crafting of the language is another way to create another layer uh, on top of that it's not me or my experience it's mediated and heightened and also distanced through those decisions. And so performance closes that gap. and Maybe it's a little bit uncomfortable, but at the same time, it's also really great to be in a room where people can hear the work and you can see the mm. response to the work. So it's kind of all of those things. It's a really good question. Yeah. Any other questions?
So when, when Elizabeth and Amanda approached publishers initially um, and they perhaps read it wrong, or what, what kind of boxes were they trying to fit into? How did they misread it? Uh, I think that work like a lot of ours, it, there's an expectation of what poetry might be, there's an expectation of what memoir might be, there's an expectation of what fiction might be, whatever genres that you're thinking of. And I think it's when you work, work that's a lot of those together or n just breaks that apart, people don't know what expectations to bring to that. And so if they are a poetry publisher, they think, well, this is the way that it looks. And the, the poetry publisher I was talking about just didn't even see, just didn't even see the design, didn't see the intentionality behind it. So th I think that would, that's kind of something, I, I've lost you, Ian. <laughs> but that's, if you read up on like hybrid forms, that's still what people want. How is it between genres? No, it exists in all of them. And you're making those decisions with all of them. So. And, and where can it sit on the shelf in yeah. the bookshop? And there is no. Just as yeah. simple as that. Yeah, that is often a big, genuine problem, isn't it? <laughs> oh. yeah. And so when Jess saw it, when you saw it, you just you knew it wasn't like it was perfect, but you understood what it mm. was trying to do mm. and what it was doing. And I think that was revelatory and just like, oh, I can just let it be mm. this mm. thing that we've done. Yeah, that's very good to hear. Um, I just was thinking about the fact that all all of you teach um, Amanda at an art school, but otherwise on creative writing courses. And what what do you say to your students? Of, I mean, obviously there are genuine kind of challenges of producing this kind of work at, because of bookshops and things. And what what do you bring this kind of hybridity into your teaching? Um, and is it something you encourage? Yeah. Uh, um. <laughs> I, I wish, I, I wish, uh, funnily enough, I just, I've just been teaching a master's course about genre, um, mainly because they put me on it because I was away on parental leave when everyone was choosing what they were going to teach. Um, and the, the students uh, w will not read things if they haven't got swords in them or dwarves um, or if they're the wrong kind of dwarves. Um, and this has been quite a surprise to me. And, um, but it's actually very interesting because it, it, it is, it's an extreme version, but it is an, a version of what we all do when we're reading, right? Which is that we make decisions about what we're gonna read based on, um, on the, the kind of boxes that we can put things in. Um, and also, we only, we kind of perceive works in, in terms of what we already no, and so if a press, uh, like part of what you're doing is, is to create certain expectations and like allow things to sit in certain ways and, and design is a big part of that, I think. Um, but yeah, it's very raw for me right now, genre. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so, I, don't know, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think for me, um, under the guise of these generic sounding courses, like advanced writing practice, we actually have a lot of freedom to teach what we like. So I've been really fortunate that I could teach artist books and um, creative critical writing. So I think I've been lucky in that respect. I'm interested in the kind of recent spate of publishing of art writing and of, of intertitles, a really great book <laughs> published by Prototype, um, and how artists are kind of reclaiming text as part of their practice. Um, but at the same time, part of me, because I guess I was called myself a poet or someone who works in poetry. I want to claim back <laughs> some of this hybrid interdisciplinary art writing practice for poetry. So that's what I'm thinking about at the moment, um, that mm. art writing isn't just in the realm of artists working with text, but poets are also working experimentally across different forms. So yeah, that's, yeah, that's really yeah. interesting. <laughs> Do you think there's a lot still a lot of space still for that to happen in poetry, isn't there? Um, yeah. Any other thoughts about that? Any other questions? Mm -hmm. well, I, I should say that we do, I think I'm in a brilliant position to be able to design courses and to be able to pitch to people. I do an art of essaying course, which is um, with uh, Glasgow School of Arts, Emlet, it's a core course for that, but also has our students on it. And, but I love interdisciplinary, so teach reading, writing, death and dying, and that's across you know college. And I've got colleagues who are one of them, 
is here, Colin, um, who does amazing. We just kind of are, that's the kind of department that we are. That's the kind of, we really don't think specifically, and Jane, <laughs> we both think specifically um, in terms of genre. And actually, I was reading an essay by Jenny Bowley. I don't know if people know Jenny Bowley, and she's basically like, I don't really care what the students come with. They're like, she just loves essay. And I think that's one of the things I'm just so, I can't make my brain not think this way anymore. Yeah. And so that's why, in some ways, I love, I love how language puts pressure on things, and so I, I can't not really teach that element. But um, maybe I'm lucky because I've been able to design the, the courses so far. And I, th I think at art school, have an ex Jim I think I, I do encourage, I, I think my mantra, and I, I don't know, I probably say it at least once a week, is find the form that suits your idea. And while I teach in the painting and printmaking department, and I, I started off as a printmaker, but I've never just been able to do prints because it's never quite worked. You know, I think there's something about you can't just do everything. There's a craft you have to learn, you have to try, you have to edit, you have to learn how to do things in different ways. But I think there's something about, yeah, like just finding the form that that fits, that, that I think is really incredibly important, especially I think in an undergrad when people don't necessarily know what it is they want to do yet. You know, it's an important just to try, try lots of things out and you'll fail, but it's really important to fail. It's really important for you to do stuff that just isn't very good at all. <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> um, but actually you'll do stuff that's not very good and then like a month or two or a couple of years on, you'll go back and there'll be little kernels of things that you've learned from just trying out all these different things. And, that's, and that comes back to that in between again. That comes back to the exciting bit of not really knowing what it is you want to do, but you know there's something that you're trying to find. Any other questions? No. Anything else anyone wants to add? I think we're pro is it? it's probably time, isn't it? Quarter past. Yeah. Um, okay. I think in that case, I'll just say thank you to everyone for coming. Um, all of these brilliant writers' books um, are for sale. Um, I really can't recommend them uh, more, <laughs> obviously. But but <laughs> genu genuinely, they are brilliant books, all um, so different and all incredibly powerful in their own way. Um, thank you so much for coming. It's really been so lovely to see a room full of people. Um, and thank you again, Ian. Um, and I'm sure we will go to a pub somewhere if anyone wants to join us. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you, Jess. The four of you. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Jess. <laughs>